G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is Richard Van Emden, who has written more than 20 books about the Great War and has spoken to 270 veterans about their experiences of the Great War. And Richard has joined us today to share some of those stories. Hi, Richard. Thanks for joining us on True Blue History. Pleasure, Adam. Pleasure. So, Richard, for you, what sparked your passion and love for World War One history, and what made you get into interviewing and recording the stories of veterans? Um, it's 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 hard to put, put an absolute finger on what started my interest. I think it was seeing a program just randomly on television, sort of you know, just switched on, and there was this program. And it was in would have been in 1984. Um, and uh, I think that's what sparked my interest because I saw this program. I know that that Christmas, my mother said to you, you know, what do you want for Christmas? And I remember saying, I'd like a memoir of the, of, of the First World War by somebody who was there. And she said, well, I'll get you goodbye to all that by Robert Graves. And I read that book and I was instantly hooked, absolutely instantly hooked. And I remember standing in a shop and I was a penniless student and uh, there were all these First World War books. and They're all fairly rubbish, actually, but I remember, you know, I, I had no idea how good or how bad they were at that time. But I remember thinking, if I'm going to spend the money that I have as a student, which is thin, to put it mildly, on a Great War book, then I know that this is the start of something big. If I walk away now, it won't be. And I bought this first book, which I actually only threw away about a month ago, because it really was rubbish. But I bought this first book and I knew I just had that commitment to that moment I'm in. And, uh, and I remember just thinking that I think the programme that I'd seen also had some interviews with veterans on it. And I just thought, I want to meet the guys who are there. You know, I just want to talk. I've all, I, I'm very sort of, you know, I, I love oral history anyway. Uh, and I thought, what better thing to do than, you know, get down to the Chelsea pensioners, you know, learn what the medal ribbons are, walk around there until I see a guy with some medal ribbons of the First World War. And that's exactly what I did. I walked around and I met a guy called Ernie, um, who was born in 1899, and he'd been at Passchendaele. And we talked, we hardly, I mean, I didn't really know what to ask him, but we chatted, and I knew at that moment I wanted to carry on interviewing those veterans. So from then on, it was just a question of finding them. So you interviewed over 270 veterans from, from the Great War, and what were the processes that you used to find potential veterans? Well, it was so multifaceted, really. I mean, later on, when I was making documentaries, uh, there was a lot of, you know, mail outs, you know, you would, because I was working for a company, we could just do a mail out to a thousand newspapers. And in those days, people read the local newspapers to the extent they just don't now. So you used to get a fantastic response from that. But in the early days, I was very much on my own. And so what I used to do, uh, I was at a, a place called Newcastle University, Newcastle upon Tyne. And what I used to do was, was, I reckon that the old people's homes were down on the coast, so down at places like Colourcoats and um, Whitley Bay and places like this. So I used to literally go down there on the tube, get out there, get out there, and just literally go to old people's homes and knock on the door. So I'd walk it down a road and it would say, you know, sunny side home. And I'd go knock on the door and I'd say, have you got any veterans here? And I quickly learned that if I said, have you got any Great War veterans? They often said no. But if I said, have you got any man aged over 90, which they would have to pretty well be at that time, they would often go, oh, yeah, we've got a couple of those. And so uh, that's how I, I used to find them. In, in fact, one of my really great early veterans, a friend of mine, he heard that I was interested. And he said, I've just been on a coach from Edinburgh to Newcastle with a chap called Robbie Burns telling me why he hated hay. Now, he really did all that, I don't know. But he said, I'm the only Robbie Burns in Whitney Bay. So I got the telephone directory. Sure enough, Robbie Burns went there, knocked on his door. He opened the door. And he was a great, he was in the um, uh, Duke of Wellington's uh, on the Somme in 16 and Arras in 17. Uh, was in the attack at Beaumont, at, at, um, uh, at the Butte de Wallen Corps, right at the end of the battle. And a uh, fantastic veteran, you know, and he was just there. He was just in his own private home. I was just lucky that he happened to sit next to a friend of mine on a coach. So there were loads of ways, you know, but very often it was people hearing that you had a passion about it. And uh, I met several veterans who were the grandfathers of students, student friends of mine, because these grandfathers still only had to be 90, even 89, 1991 to be eligible so I met I met a guy in a siege battery from a siege battery in Edinburgh he was the grandfather of another friend of mine so it, it, it just it rolled at that time it was relatively easy 
Um, there was still enough of them about. It wasn't that hard. So how, once you found the veterans, like a good group of veterans, Richard, how willing were the veterans to share their experiences of the, of the Great War? Well, to my astonishment, actually, I virtually had, in all the time I interviewed veterans, I had almost no refusals. Um, I had one refusal, but that was because he'd been on the radio and, and, he, and he'd had a horrible interview. And not so much that the interview was bad, but he couldn't hear properly and he got quite upset about it. And so he said, oh, that's it. I'm not talking about it anymore. So that was kind of a refusal. But in terms of people just saying, I don't want to visit that, that time again no thank you i actually had none um which is sounds astonishing but um uh, i had veterans who curtailed what they would tell you veterans who would sort of maybe smile slightly and then change the subject or or just brush over it very quickly um but uh yeah i mean it, it was almost as if i mean i had veterans who said to me look 20 years ago i wouldn't have spoken to you but i'm 95 now if I don't speak to you, then I take it to the grave and I want my grandchildren or my relatives and I don't want to speak to them about it. I don't want, you know, it was easier for them to speak to a third party that they thought would never, they would never meet again than it was necessarily to speak to, to family members. So very often they would say, look, OK, well, um, yeah, OK, I realise if I don't talk about it now, I never will. And, and that opened up a lot more doors than I think it would have done had it been 10, 15 years earlier. In your opinion, Richard, how important is an oral historian and what do you consider to be the benefits of oral history? Well, I mean, oral history is just one piece of the jigsaw. You know, I know that it's not the be all and end all. But equally, you know, I know that there have been historians in the past who said, oh, well, you can't rely on what these veterans say. And it's, you know, they're, 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 they're remembering memories on memories on memories from 80 years ago. You can't rely on it. Well, I don't believe that either. So I think it's just one part of this bigger puzzle that you put together. And I, my job is because I love oral history. That's my that's my field. You know, I'm, I'm not into technical stuff. I'm not into weaponry or tanks or even generals. In particular. I'm into, interested in the individual story. And what you get is, OK, you know, a soldier only has the vision of what he can see in front of him. It might be 100 yards to the right and 100 yards to the left. He can't tell you, you know, when a veteran started spinning off into the greater campaign, you know, that's when I lost interest because they couldn't possibly have known that has to be from history books. So what I wanted was the, the small stuff, the, the, the idiosyncratic stories that, that would go to the grave if they didn't tell me. So, you know, um, uh, how do you hide chalk from a, from a, 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 a mine? You know, you're, you're digging a mine in the German trench, you bring out all this chalk. Well, you know, you sow um, cress, water cress on top. Of, apparently it grows like wildfire on top of chalk and you can hide chalk very quickly with watercress or well, not watercress not watercress but cress you know the um uh uh you know things like that. there was another there was another story of a chap saying well you know you spring up the the dixies for the food from i was a signaler but i would have to go back and get the dixies and i used to i quickly learned to tie sandbags around my legs because you know these dixies had sat on open fire or whatever and and they there was lots of sort of soot and wrap on the on the edge so that would go into my uniform so i learned to tie sandbags around my legs as I bought the Dixies up. So those sort of little stories, which I just love because you know that um, uh, that, that would have gone to the grave with them and we would never be any the wiser. These little, little stories. I mean, I was even reading the other day and, and you know, this is a, a memoir of one chap who was saying, you know, they use creosote to deal with the, with the lice. Well, I've never heard of anybody using creosote, but it was a battalion-wide instruction. Now that is all right. That's not oral history. That's the that's the memoir of an individual. But that's the little story I'm after. So yeah, there were veterans who could give me, you know, uh, views on on what I considered quite historically important events. But what I was always after was what did how did the war you know work for you? You know, what did you see? How did you feel? What did you know? What are the little stories that you can tell me that you won't get in the grand histories? Absolutely, I think, and it's a. It's the personal stories that make it more for people who listen to oral history. It we connect with them a lot more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 just that personal touch. You know, absolutely, it's, absolutely. It's, it's there's nothing. You know, um, before we went on air, I said I'm, I'm chasing this hundred, nearly hundred and twelve year old <laughs> lady because 
she's the daughter of someone who died in the Great War and she remembers him. And I want that connection. I want to keep that connection going with the Great War, you know, living connection for as long as I possibly can. And I know this is about as, as close as it gets to the edge, but, you know, I'm praying that she will, you know, she'll go on for a little bit longer yet because, you know, she's apparently all there. It would be a great story. I'd love to hear it. The World War One veterans didn't receive any support for what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder. Did any of the men you interviewed share how they were or weren't coping with life after the Great War? Uh, yes. Um, uh, there were quite a few who were embittered about the way that they were treated. Um, Frank Sumter, I remember saying that, um, it, you know, he, he was at the Rifle Brigade, was at the Christmas Truce, actually, in 1914. Um, but he was shot in the shoulder and, and he um, that ruined his career. I, I can't quite recall. It was something to do with stitching. But he, he said that ruined my career and no one had any sympathy for me for that. You know, they said, get a job. Well, you know, I had a trained, very sophisticated job that I could no longer do. And now you're just telling me to get any old job. Well, that's fine. But, you know, he, he felt very upset. And there were others, too, who, who again, uh, I remember one man who, who was the only veteran I ever met, actually, who sort of returned to the Western Front, who he was he was pretty well blind. And when he talked, he kind of relived he relived the, the war, actually, through his eye. It was, it was quite an extraordinary uh, character. But one of the things he talked about was was the sort of accusations that he wasn't pulling his way after the war, that he wasn't looking for a job hard enough, that he wasn't, you know, this is a guy who'd been through the most horrendous traumas. And he was very angry that, that people were pressurising him to, to, to find employment when he claimed he had been trying to find employment. And they were saying, we don't believe you. And it was that kind of mistrust, that distrust of veterans, um, believing that they were just pulling a fast one. And there was a, there, so there was a lot of that kind of thing. Um, uh, there were those who talked about psychological issues after the war as well. And, and also, interestingly, those who, who had very few um, effects. I remember see, uh, interviewing one veteran called G.B. Jameson, who was in the artillery, been in his hussars and then the artillery. And I said, were there any after effects at all? You know, cars backfiring, did you hit the floor? And he said, no, no. He said, I, I really didn't have any post-war traumas whatsoever he said the only thing I found was that if I went into a field or went into the countryside I would immediately my eye would scan the fields to sight a battery he was an officer in the battery. he said I, I couldn't help but look for positions for my guns but he said that was the only thing after the war that, I, that, that, that from which the war impinged upon my civil life other than that he said I was absolutely fine so you get both sides of the story, those who were embittered, those who were, did have some traumas. I mean, I remember interviewing one veteran who was in the tank attack at, uh, at Flares on the 15th of September, probably the, well, certainly the last survivor of that. And, uh, and his, his daughter was in the room. And I never liked family being in the room when we were filming because um, you felt that that might inhibit what the veteran said. But this guy lost it completely in terms of he forgot totally that she was there. And he started talking about shell shock and about sitting in a dugout, shaking like a leaf, and being really embarrassed about it all. And I could hear just his daughter faintly in the background saying, he's never said this, he's never, I've never heard of this, I've never heard any of this. And luckily, he didn't really, he didn't, I don't think he heard her, but I don't think he, he, he'd forgotten that she was there, and he was just being really honest in a way that he'd never been quite with his family. So I felt incredibly privileged at that moment. For you, once you got more experienced as you went on interviewing the veterans, could you see with oral history that the veterans would sometimes t hold back and only tell you a certain part of the story? Or, or could you, as you got more experienced, could you spot if they were holding back on their emotions if it was too traumatic for them to talk? Yeah, I mean, undoubtedly some did. I mean, they're just, you know, there were those who just wouldn't go to play. I remember uh, interviewing a chap called um, Eustace Rushby of the first fourth Raw Barks, and uh, they were really taken apart at Tietbal uh, on the Somme. And uh, I remember asking him about that. I said, well, you know, what? And he just said, he said, look, there was a lot of food when we came back, as in, you know, the guys, the guys who'd come back, their haversacks were, you know, full of food or whatever. And he kind of, that's all he would say. We, we got a lot of food when we came back. And he had this look in his eye that said, you know, let's not go there anymore. He was at Pilkham Ridge at Pashadell as well. And he 
help take them a, a pillbox, but he wouldn't really go into how they took the pillbox other than the fact that he got a, a pair of Zeiss binoculars, which he still had, and a, and a, um, a, a helmet, which he jettisoned. Um, so, you know, there were, there were aspects that they would, they would talk about, but made it clear that they wouldn't go much further. But to a certain extent, with some veterans, it was trust. You know, they, they would, if they began to trust you, if they began to think that you were being, you were sympathetic to their stories and you understood them, that you'd done some research, that you knew what you were talking about, then they would be more forthcoming. And I always remember a veteran saying to me, being interviewed for television, and this interviewer said, okay, so, uh, you know, tell me about your best mates that you lost. You know, opening gambit, tell me about the best mate. And he just went, you think I'm going to tell him anything? You think I'm going to open up? He said, there's no chance. He said, that was the end of the interview. You know, I wasn't interested. And that's the other thing too. If you showed ignorance, then they would think, why should I tell you things that are so important to me that you clearly don't care about? But equally, the other the flip the flip side of that was that if they began to trust you and understood that you really were genuinely interested and that you knew your stuff, then they would tell you more than they might otherwise otherwise do. But you know, as I said, there were veterans who just couldn't go to places that just. In fact, Harry Patch. I don't know if you're in Australia you're aware of the last Britain's last veteran, Harry Patch. Um, he, I thought I knew his his story pretty well. You know, I interviewed him. I mean, I met him at 100 and he lived to 111, so I had 11 years with Harry. And just before he died, he started telling me a story about um, headless men. And uh, I realised that he did a bit of battlefield recovery, again, probably after the, the, the fight at Langemark on the 16th of August, 17. I, I suspect he was involved in something like that. Uh, I didn't quite know because he was involved in the Second World War in Bath, where there was a lot of bombing and he was... Um, he was working there. So I, uh, at first I said, but, but Harry, we're talking First War, Second War here. He said First World War. And I thought, you know, I've written his book. It's out there now. It's what he wanted to say. And it really, I could see it was really distressing him. And I said, Harry, you don't need to tell me this. And I snuffed and I said that. Normally I wanted it, but I just thought, you know, 111 years old and this story is coming out now. And I'm not sure you actually want to tell me, but I think, you're just you find just you're a bit depressed you find yourself in a bit of kind of cul-de-sac and you're telling me something and i said look harry it's fine tell me if you want to but don't tell me and he sort of stopped and moved away from it but it was an incident that he clearly was still really deep and i though i'd known him for 11 years he'd never mentioned it and right before he died he started to talk about it then as i say i'm not entirely clear what happened because we, we moved off the subject but i suspect it was something to do with that it, even still, after all those years, you, it, it still affected him. It, it, it's amazing. And that's, like you say, that's the reason oral history is so important. Yeah. Well, he could go into quite dark places. You know, he, you know, there are some wonderful photographs of him when we took him back to, to Ypres and he swore he'd never go back. And we, were, we, we went back with him. I can't remember. It was 2004, I think, the first time. And... Uh, he always said, no, I'm never going to go back. And it was a huge thing for him to go back. And there were times when, you know, we'd sit in a cafe and he would have a little kitten on his knee and he'd be smiling and beaming. And then there were other times when he was sat, you know, perhaps at the memorial at Pilkham Ridge or whatever to the 20th division. And he would just go into a really dark place and you would see it in his, his eyes and he would get very low. And, and um, so, you know, you were asking a hell of a lot of these people especially at the age he was but you know having said that harry and you know he lived to be 111 and i think he lived to that age because he he had a renewed interest in life you know people were interested in him he got to places like buckingham palace and 10 down his street that you don't get to go so uh you know i, I there was a kind of trade-off between the two but he did say at one point he said god people only want to talk to me about my war you know, I was out there three months or something, you know, he said it was nothing compared to some people. That's all they want to talk about. And that's why the idea of writing his book, you know, we did this book, The Last Fighting Tommy, because I said to him, look, well, why don't we tell the rest of your story? Why don't we go, you know, I don't need to know much more about your war now. Let's tell your life story. And he was so happy to do that because he said that three months was all anyone wanted to speak about. But, you know, as I say, so there were ups and downs and there were, you know, there were times when, I say he went to dark places, but other times he loved it too. So, um, you know, uh, that kept him going, I'm sure. As all of the veterans of the Great War are now gone, 
How important was it for you to record their stories before it was too late? Oh, it was really important. I mean, it's again, before we started recording, we were talking about this and I, I, I had the opportunity to do the same for the Second World War as I have done for the First World War and I've decided not to do that. And um, partly I don't have the kind of commitment, the energy, you know, I have other commitments, family commitments and things to do what I did when I was free and single. I could just travel around the country. Um, but also I'm aware of, of a lot more people interviewing veterans this time, the Second World War. When I was doing it for the First World War, okay, the Imperial War Museum was doing it, but I never came across veterans who said, oh, I've been interviewed by X down the road or Y. They, there were one or two people going around, as I later discovered, but essentially every veteran I met had never told his story to anybody. Or almost, that was certainly 90% of the cases. But now with the Second World War, there are so many people out there interviewing that I don't feel the need to go and, 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 and get this oral history as I did, that, that compulsion to do it for the First World War. But I just felt it was incredibly important. As I say, it's one piece of that jigsaw. It was, um, if I didn't do it, then it was going to go to the grave. And, um, and there are so many small stories that are just, just, just so beautiful, you know, just so fantastic. You couldn't hope to read that in a battalion war diary or a, or a you know, or, or a, bat- a regimental history, you know, and that's what, that's why it's so important. Not that everything they tell you is true, you know, and not, not that they're lying necessarily, you know, they can, they can just misremember what, what happened. Um, but occasionally also you met veterans who, who did try and pull a yarn and, and you had to learn how to kind of filter that. Uh, I remember interviewing one nurse. Uh, we were interviewing nurses for the Great War, uh, uh, from the Great War, and I met this exceptionally young-looking First World War nurse. I couldn't believe how young, you know, she was. She said she was ninety-seven, and uh, I thought, "Wow, you know, you look amazing." And she, uh, she, she was telling me about her, her, her life as a nurse in nineteen seventeen, and it sounded absolutely authentic, and it, and I really went along with it. And then I saw she, I saw these medals. I said, "Oh, you got the fourteen fifteen star." You know, and she said, oh, yes. I said, well, can I look at them? She said, oh, no, you don't look at those things, you know. They, they gave those things away. Well, I thought, well, you wouldn't get the 1415 star if you were out in France in 1917. So I went, hang on a minute. And I did a bit more research. And what she was, she was a nurse from the Second World War. So that's why her stories work so well, because she had that interaction with soldiers. She knew what wounds looked like. You know, it was so authentic. But what she wanted to do was when they walked down the street on November the 11th, she wanted to stand out with sec- first war medals as opposed to everybody else who was standing, it was with second war or later medals. And it was about being seen to be something better than she actually was. And that was so disappointing. I was gutted when I, when I realized that that was the case, but uh, you know, what can you do? But you, you learn to, you know, and occasionally that happened. You just learn to filter things. One guy told me he was in the Ninth Lancers in 1914 and his service record survived at the National Archives, it showed clearly he went out in 1915 with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Why he needed to make that story, this additional story up, which was pretty dramatic, I have no idea. It's like it was somebody else's story that he just took on board. And whether he'd forgotten he didn't do it or whether he thought he did, but it clearly wasn't the case. And so, you know, you have to use your head a bit and, and, and think about what could they have seen, what could they have done. But on the whole, actually, and I, I was more... You know, people said, no, 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 you know, once you get in their 90s, you can forget it as, as oral history. But that just wasn't the case. As I say, the small stories, incredibly important. But even then, they could give incredible stories about, uh, about slightly bigger picture events that were historically important, which were also incredibly accurate. Absolutely. And I think you touch on a key point there, Richard, is that it's your job as an oral historian to have the skill to pick up and check your facts and make sure that it is it is a, a, a true story. It's not just made up. And because if we all went off that, well, we, they could be telling us absolute garbage, and you take it as gospel. And if you don't check your facts, that's where I think it's it's so important as any historian to check to check your sources and, and cross reference them to make sure they are true. Yeah, and I think if you've been been through the, if you've genuinely been through the First World War. I don't quite see why, why you would need to make stories up because you're going to have a hell of a lot of amazing stories. But even so, you know, and there were those, there were those who, I met a chap called Cecil Withers right at the end of his life. And he was incredibly, he was a really bright man anyway, but he was just 
he never t- told his story before. And what he told me just, I could go to the battalion diary and it really did, you know, it matched up. Not, not in matched up in a way that made you suspicious he'd ever read the battalion diary, but it just showed that he had such a good brain right to the end of his life. And I remember saying, um, you know, little things would just spark off with him. I remember saying, oh, do you remember going to a plan- place called Grand Rulicor? And he went, oh, Grand Rulicor, Christmas 1916. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. He said, I remember was getting, we got Daily Mail Christmas pudding sent out to us. And he said, yeah, I always remember that place. And it was just, yeah, an inconsequential little fact. But it showed you that, you know, you could, it wasn't just he was, you know, reacting rote to certain questions he'd heard a million times before. He was sparking off on all sorts of things that, that could, that, that you knew were real. You know, he didn't make up that story. I mean, it was, why would you? But, you know, he didn't make up that story about, there's Christmas puddings at Grand Rooley Core, and it's historically of no consequence. But I just love that little detail because what it said to me was that when he did remember things, it was going to be pretty accurate and I could rely on it. it. This might be a hard question to you, but all the veteran stories are important. But for all the stories that, of the 270 veterans that you interviewed, which ones stood out the most to you and why? Well, I mean, I have to, uh, on Remembrance Day, I, I, you know, obviously we all remember that those who, who lost their lives, but I also remember the living too, and, and I remember the families and the children, and I always remember five veterans, always go through my mind, my five favourite veterans, and uh, one of them, um, and I was talking about historical events, was a chap called Benjamin Clouting, and uh, he was 16 years old when he went to, uh, to France in August 14. And he took part, he was in the 4th Royal Irish Dragoon Guards and took part in the very first action of the Great War when the cavalry, the 4th Dragoon Guards met the, the, German, uh, the German cavalry just outside um, Casteaux. And I couldn't believe that a mile from my house was the world's last survivor of this historically important engagement. You know, the first action of the BEF in France, and I've got a guy who was there. Oh boy, oh boy, was he historic. I mean, incredibly detailed and just, oh, I mean, you know, I mean, it was just, how can you get better than that? So in fact, uh, my son is called Benjamin because on Benjamin Clouting's deathbed, I whispered in his ear, if I ever have a son, I'm going to call him after you. And because he meant so much to me, because of so much that he gave me, but but he's, you know, his stories were so interesting. He was at the, the, the he, he took part in the in the cavalry charge at Eluge two days later, when the Fourth Dragoon Guards and Ninth Lancers tore across his fields against artillery and, and rifle fire. I mean, incredibly historically significant events. So for him, you know, he ranks right up there, right at number one, really. But then I've got friends, you know, people like a chap called Wally Popple, who was in the Eighth King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry, went over the top on the 1st of July, 1916. And he his description, again, of going over, saying, I knew I was going to die. I think he was in the fourth wave. And he said, I'd seen the first three waves get cut down. He said, I knew I was going to die. And he said, that puts you in a very funny situation sort of state of mind and he walked almost as far as the German wire before he was shot here in the second intercostal space and he still had the bullet so he, he had the bullet taken out of his shoulder and he's the detailed description of that and what I love about going to the Somme is when you have a very specific story and where the the eighth coilies went over it's a very specific piece of ground you can walk and it's nothing like standing there in a lane which was basically worked as their frontline trench anyway, knowing that this, with, I'm within probably 50 yards either way of where he went and then being able to see straight ahead the ground that he covered and where he was shot. So there are, it, 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 it's when you can, it's when you have either an incredibly historically important event or whether you have an event which you can locate in time and space and it's just extraordinary, you know, it just, it just makes such a difference. But, and then there were veterans, there was another veteran I knew called Vic Cole, he's in my top five, um, again, local guy to me where I lived in, in Reading at the time. Um, and he's special because he was nearby, I could go and see him every weekend. Um, again, very erudite, very bright man, uh, really good memories, I mean, very, very strong memories of the Great War. And uh, I say sort of no pride in a funny sort of way because 
I remember he saying uh, he was he was busted down from being a lance corporal to a, to a private on several occasions. And there was one time when I met a chap who was in the same battalion. He was in the seventh uh, King's Own, um, uh, the seventh Royal West Kent Regiment, transferred to the first battalion. And when he was in the first battalion again, he got drunk in Italy when they were in Italy, and he got busted down to a to a private again. And I'd met another guy who was in the first battalion, and, I, and he said, "Oh my God!" He said, "Tell him, tell him." Does he remember a square? I can't remember the, in this town. I was marched out in front of the whole battalion, had my stripe ripped off my arms in front of everybody. <laughs> He said, ask him if he remembers that. Now that to me, most people would find that humiliating and embarrassing and not something you but he was like, I don't care. Tell him, <laughs> ask him if he remembers it. Because that's why he will remember me. You know, and uh, things like this. So, so veterans like that who just give it everything, who will talk about every sordid aspect of the war as well, you know, prostitution, whatever. You just think that is fantastic because most veterans, they might open up about all sorts of things, but there are certain things they won't open up about. And um, so there were three three veterans there that I absolutely right up there, um, top three, really, of, of all those that I met with Harry Patch, of course, in there, too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, and there were so many veterans I met once and once only, either because I went there and I thought their memories are gone now, you know, that there's not much there. Or they were just so far away. You know, I went to interview a nurse, a Great War nurse who, who served in France, aged 18. Um, and she lived in a place called Drum the Drocket, which is in near Inverness in Scotland. Well, I was only ever going to see her once. So some veterans mattered more than others because you saw them more or they mattered more because they just were brilliant storytellers and took you back there and were really willing to share what they had with you. Um, yeah, it's 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 fantastic. It really is. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll like, just I grab You're this quickly. I'll tell you one thing. If I can find it quickly enough, uh, can I find it? Uh, I have a I have a gift from one veteran who gave it to me, and typically enough, uh, I can't find it. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. I had a I've got a um, a disc, an identity disc. Um, from a soldier who was, uh, uh, he was, um, uh, he was at um, uh, St. Quentin in 1918, and a bullet went through the identity disc, through his number and name on his wrist, went out through his wrist out the other side. And so the identity disc is there with the bullet hole straight through it. And uh, we just got really, really well. And he said, I'm going to offer you one of two things. He said, you can either have my cap badge from 1915, where a bullet hit the cap badge, he was in the um, uh, rifle brigade, and it's got a crown on top. He said the bullet hit the crown on the on my cap badge. Well, we had soft caps on and deflected the bullet. Which it would have killed me. And the, you can see the crown was missing, but the, the rest of the badge is here. You could have that. We could have this with my with the bullet that I took in 1918. I went, oh my god, you know. <laughs> so in the end, I said, you you know, you sure you want to give me this? He said, yep, yeah, I want you to have one of these. So um, I took I took the one with his name on at least. But you know, it's a souvenir of a veteran that. You know, I met him actually, I did meet him a few times, but he probably wouldn't have been so special in my mind other than the fact that he was so kind to me. He gave me something which is obviously incredibly personal to him because he was what he wanted to do. And so, you know, that's a, you know, the veterans, veterans like that that I, I have a fondness for, but they're not quite in my in my top five. It sounds awful to say it, but that's that's the case. Absolutely. And I guess in in a sense, Richard, you've got a it's it, like you said it's it, favorites not it's not the right word but it's it's the personal yeah. connection that's that's you and some veterans you had a more personal connection with than others yeah i mean i'm, I'm just remembering one veteran i'm, I'm very inter interested in the army of occupation that went to cologne after the great war and i found this veteran and i think it was somewhere around about it wasn't it was north of birmingham maybe nottingham or somewhere like that and he'd agreed to see me and i was i He'd been, in, he'd been through the war, but I particularly wanted to talk about his occupation time. And I got up there, I drove up there, and he'd obviously got out of bed the wrong side that morning. And he said, I'm not, I'm not talking to you today. And I remember saying, well, hang on a minute, I've just seen a great talk to him. I've just <laughs> driven up from love. The only time I had a kind of bit of an argument with the veteran, I said, I've just driven from Re Reading, it would have been, you know, it's taken me four hours to get here. You can't just turn around and say you're not interested. <laughs> you know, you sat there in a the chair, talk to me. He said, well, I'll give you five minutes. And that five minutes, I managed to string out to about probably about 25 minutes just by cajoling him and sort of moaning a little bit. And, you know, and he was not a veteran I was ever going to see again. 
But I did get quite an interesting interview out of him about Cologne, but he resented it all the way. I just forced <laughs> him to tell me. So that, you know, so I look back at a kind of fondness with him, but there was no personal connection really. It was just, but I, it, it was a kind of one of those interviews you look back and think, I did well to get 25 minutes out of him instead of the, the zero that he was offering when I arrived. So yeah. Yeah, lots of funny stories too. In hindsight for you, Richard, once all the veterans had passed, was there any questions that you wanted to ask them but you didn't? And why are those questions important to you now? Oh, gosh. <laughs> there are a thousand and one questions. You listen to the tape, so because a lot of the early stuff is all on cassette tape. And if you listen back, and I'm very worried about listening back to them now because uh, I'm worried about the tape screwing up and stuff. But I listen back and I go, ask the question, ask the question. You know, the veteran said something and I just haven't picked up on it. Or I've just kind of, th- I've obviously thought I'll come back to it, but I don't. So a lot of things like that where, you know, when you can stand back with the benefit of a bit more experience and also hindsight, you can go, oh, you just, you've totally missed the, the key question there. And there's one veteran that I remember um and I don't really blame myself. I just missed a historically important event because I didn't realise it for what it was. And it was a chap called Genoa. Uh, he'd been with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Um, interesting war. Uh, not the best interviewee in the world, but, you know, good enough. And at one point he said, my brother was murdered in Brandenburg POW camp. Now, I didn't know anything about this. And this was actually a big, big case in British politics at the time. A chap, Abel Seaman Genoa, was bayoneted and pushed back into a burning hut at Brandenburg POW camp. And it became such an important issue that there was a government white paper on it. It made the newspaper. It was a big, big story at the time. And I remember him saying, oh, my brother was at this Abel Seaman Genoa was murdered, blah, blah, blah. I remember thinking, yeah, but you weren't there. That's not your war. That's your brother. So let's keep let's keep on. Let's keep on the song, shall we? Let's see that. You know, because I'd never heard of the story. I had no idea it was even significant. And I look back and go, oh, no, if I'd only put, if I'd said, OK, give me 10 minutes on on your brother, I would have got, you know, so much of the, so, so much more of the story. Um, another thing I'm really interested in is the soldiers' own cameras. I've done a lot of books recently utilising the privately taken and illegally taken photographs. And there were veterans in the past who said to me in the early days, you know, I had a camera. And I went, all oh, right, you know, oh, interesting. Anyway, tell me about something else. Because I didn't realise that cameras were illegal. I didn't realise, <laughs> I just, I look at I think, what was I thinking? You know, surely, surely uh, you would go down the sort of story, of, well, why, where did you put it? How did you carry it? What sort of films were you using? What did you take? But no, you, I just missed the story. And so they've got a couple of interviews where, you know, one guy who was in the Seaforth Highlanders, Norman Collins, said, I used to, I knew it was illegal, so I used, I hid it in my sporran. But, you know, and I kind of go, okay, that's interesting. Okay, you know, tell me about Bowman Hamill on the 13th of November. And again, I look back and weep at what I lost at that moment. All I needed to do was spend 10 or 15 minutes on the cameras, on their significance, and I would have got so much more. Just didn't ask the question. You know, that's the way it goes. Hi, as we say, Richard, hindsight is a wonderful thing. It's it's you mm. you can sometimes go back and you, you wish you could go back and ask those certain things and then other thing other times you it's yeah, you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have asked that or I should have asked that, shouldn't have asked that. Yeah. It's that it's the old it's the old cliche. But even the professionals do it. I you know, Peter Hart, a great friend of mine you know, did all this incredible oral history of the Great War. And he, listening to his tapes at the Imperial War Museum, they're fantastic to listen to, you know, and he's very episodic. So he goes, you know, starts at the start and goes all the way through. So he doesn't jump around. I tended to jump around a lot more, which is a good and a bad thing. And I remember one veteran talking, it was about a chap who was going to be shot at dawn. And he talks about it. And Peter says, Oh, but that's in 1916. And he goes, yeah, and he said, we're in 15. So let's keep on 15. We'll come back to it. And he never came back to it. And it was actually quite, a, again, it was quite, a, I got the story because I jumped around and ended up getting the story because I went, oh, that's interesting. Tell me about that. And Peter, no doubt, got a hell of a lot more than I ever did because he was, you know, he was, he was, you know, more methodical about the way he went about things. And he was also more experienced. But I remember that being that one, that one particular story thinking, yeah, it was about, 
getting it, either making a note and coming back to it, which has been fair enough, or going for it at that moment saying, okay, this is significant. Let's get this story in the bag. You know, you never know. A veteran could, you know, get too tired to talk anymore, not feel, you know, you never knew. I mean, for example, I'll give you one example. I was going to interview a chap called Robert Rennick in uh, Northumberland in um, near Newcastle by time. I was we drove, driving up from Bristol. So it's a heck of a long way, if you know England. And uh, he said, this is my one and only TV interview. After this, I don't talk about the war anymore. And we we're on our way up and we got a call and they said he died this morning. So on the oh. day he was going to do this, five, this one and only for TV interview, uh, and it would have been a good one, is it? Delville Wood, all sorts of places. Um, he just passed away, age 99 and three quarters that morning. So you never knew, you never know with veterans, you know, you, as you're the gentleman you would like to interview, you know, you never know. You need to try and get there while you can, you know, all things being equal. Absolutely. And I think it's, especially with coronavirus at the moment, Richard, it's where we're at a, it's oral history at the moment. We, we are losing these veterans. And I, I think we have to be on it to try and get these veterans, the last World War II veterans on yeah. before they are gone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's how you go about doing it. That's the that's the thing. I mean, the great thing about you know Zoom calls or whatever is that there are ways of interviewing which were not open to me twenty five years ago. Ab- absolutely, technology mm. has has come a long way for us to to do these interviews. And you know, yes, you're yeah. you're 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 in London, and I'm here in Australia, and it's it's great. I can talk to you, and and we can we can have yeah. a discussion. It's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. It's like being in the same room. Absolutely. So after after you interviewed the veterans, for you walking the ground again, was that was it more helpful or was it not helpful in you understanding battlefields more? Oh, enormously helpful. Uh, it, I mean, it, I mean, walking the battlefields anyway is really fascinating because you can see why 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 troops went the direction they went in. So you know, at Bowman Hammer, a lot of people have been to Newfoundland Park. You know, you're kind of if you you naturally think, okay, these are frontline trenches. The troops went that way. You know, you just you know, well, you just go forward, wouldn't you? You're told to go forward. But if you look at the lay of the land, you can see it slopes down to the right, and that's where they would have funneled. They would have funneled off down to the right because you've got at least a modicum of cut, some sort of cover. You know, so you can read the land. You can read why. Even the, the scant film there is at, at Beaumont Hamill of, of the, the troops, the men going over um, uh, just in front of the village there, that, that little bit of film, you can see the way that they're filtering on this, on this, on this film. And you can see why they're doing it. Because if you go to the battle, if you see that little bit of land, actually, yeah, you would go down there because you get, you get a little bit of cover from machine gun fire straight ahead, et cetera, et cetera. So on that level, it works. On that level, you can see why. And you can see why there were disasters too. I remember, um, I never interviewed him, but a chap called Arnold Ridley, he was in a famous um, TV program called Dad's Army, uh, a well-known actor here. And uh, he was in an attack um, near Guidecourt on the Somme. And his battalion was taken apart, absolutely taken apart. And again, you go there and there was a German trench just behind a slight hillock that they didn't even know existed. They'd arrived there that morning and gone straight into action. And again, just looking at the, you can see, okay, I can see why your battalion would be taken apart here. I can absolutely read the land and I can see why you suffered the way you did and why so few of you have got known graves because there was no way back. And he was a very fortunate survivor. So that there's that element to it, which is absolutely extraordinary. But again, it's just also the appreciation of history, you know, to stand where they stood and to know, like Harry Patch, he's got a memorial at Langemark uh, on the Steenbeck, um, which he placed there when he was 110, went over and unveiled it, which he paid for to his battalion, the 7th Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. And he told me where, he said, this is where I crossed the steam beat in, a, in the attack at Langemark. And we, we said, okay, well, we'll get this memorial, we'll take it there, and then you come over and we'll unveil it, blah, blah, blah. That memorial is one and a half metres from where the actual pontoon was that you stood on. So when he told me where it was, his description was so clear that it was impossible to make. You could look at the, the, the you know, the battalion diary and it said, yes, they crossed the steam beat here. So you knew you were in the right area. But his description of where it was, in fact, it was probably our fault that we put it one and a half metres to the right 
of where it should have been. It was only after he died that I actually found a photograph of the pontoon that he crossed over on. And it's, it's a little corner like this. And it's that pontoon's right on the corner, whereas Memorial is, is that far to the right. <laughs> you couldn't get a better, more authentically sighted memorial if you try. I mean, just incredible. And that's the thing about the Great War. You could go back and go, I know that this man stood here 100 years ago and I know that if I if if I was standing here, there if I could go back in time, he would look at me going, "What what are you doing in my way?" That is that is when history comes alive to me, when you know he would be looking at you going, oh, "I need to get past you, sorry," you know, because you're that close to where he was. Um, and yeah, you can't you can't get better than that. Absolutely, and and a first a first hand account like a, a you can't beat it. Yeah. And for you, you know, for Australians going to Anzac, I mean, given how small the area is, again, you're dealing with, if you're not on the spot, you're within metres of where that, that incident took place. Uh, I mean, yeah. You touch on a good point there, Richard, is that Gallipoli, it's, I've walked that ground as well, and I know you have. And the thing that you get hit with the most at Gallipoli is how small the place is. It is so small. Like, yeah. and, and it's just, and you can stand in the middle and especially at Anzac, you can stand in the middle and you can look, there's one end and there's the other end. And it's just, you just think the, the troops were just squashed in here like sardines. And mm. it's just, it's one battlefield that is just truly, it's an amazing battle. The whole Gallipoli Peninsula is, a, it's an amazing battlefield to walk. There's not an inch of that ground that isn't significant. And now with the Second World War, there are all sways, miles and miles of land where not an awful lot happened. Or if it did, that you, you wouldn't know specifically where it was, you know, um, because you're dealing with such a vast area in comparison. But when you're dealing with what's a couple of football pitches, you know, yeah. well, a bit bigger than that. But, you know, every single inch of that ground is significant. There's nothing that's uh, that you go, well, that wasn't important. It was. All of it was. It's just a very special place. It really is. And and I urge and I tell the listeners all the time on the podcast, Richard, that if they get the chance when we can travel again, if you can get over, go and mm. go and walk the ground, go and walk Gallipoli, go and walk the Western Front, because it's one thing to read it in in books. It's another thing to actually walk the ground in the footsteps of the men who went before us. Yeah, well, I've got I've got a friend here in London uh, who's Australian, and I regularly berate him for the fact he's never been to Gallipoli. <laughs> I chivvy you, chivvy you, say, you've got to go, you've got to go. Whether he will or not, I don't know. He doesn't have great interest in history, but I kind of think, you, I don't care. You just got to go because it will blow your mind. Absolutely, and I think that's the thing too, is that if even if you don't have an interest in history, just, just to go and, and just walk that ground, you don't have to love history to go and experience and see the, the – and I've seen it on my tours that I've been on where the person who hasn't wanted to go and they've been the most, oh, I've come along because I'm with my husband or, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm just being dragged along. By the end of the trip, they're like, oh, well, I'm actually going to go home and read about history now and actually – and the, it's the emotional connection that they get. And it, yeah. it's amazing. It really is. Yeah. I, I, I would be very disappointed if somebody said they'd been there and they were bored. I, I, I don't think we could be friends. <laughs> a, a, absolutely. No, I agree. I agree with you. So for, for you, a, as an author of World War One, what – stories do you think that still need to be told and why oh gosh uh well if i if i told you some of those that will be giving away my future books so i have to be careful <laughs> what i say i mean look there's if you really explore the great war if you really delve into it and it's your life's passion there are a thousand and one stories that still need to be told you know i've had so many people say to me okay and i've, I've written 21 books which i, I just i find staggering now because it's all kind of happened so quickly, it seems. But um, people say, well, you must have, they must have, every story must be told. Well, yes, if you think the First World War is a regurgitation of the Battle of the Somme, then it kind of has been told, okay, you can find new extracts, new stories, but, you know, it's a bit dull. So for me, it was always about, well, if I'm going to do a story, of the, if I'm going to do the Somme, for example, it's got to be different. It's got to be something else. So what is it? What's the else thing? And it was the private photographs. 
then it became, you know, then it became an important history. I would never have written a book about the summer. I've never have written about Passchendaele or anything else if I didn't have the private photographs, because I'm not interested. I'm interested in the stories that people don't think about, that, that you can kind of turn in your heads and say, okay, well, you know, you think of it in that way, but think of it in this way. So, for example, um, you know, I did a book on animals and wildlife in the Great War. Because I thought, well, hang on a minute, you've got two million men in a field. What are they doing all day? They're either looking at each other or they're playing with the trench cat or they're watching a squirrel or they're watching, you know, a stoat running along the edge of the trench or the bees. And, and I became fascinated with that story um, uh, because I thought, well, you know, we've heard about the mules and we've heard about the horses and, the, and maybe the dogs, but actually wildlife and nature reasserts itself in the most atrocious battlefield conditions and also men connect with it in a way that people don't expect or don't think so one man I remember him saying that um, and this is from his memoir I never met him that you know he was watching these geese I think flying west and thinking my god you know those geese that are flying over my trench now could be sat on my lawn in Sussex in two hours time with my family and there was that kind of connection between the two um, and there were all those sort of stories. So that to me was a story that had to be told that, that no one had thought about telling. As in, you know, what stories are out there that, that still need to be told? Well, I, I'm a bit reluctant because I'm, I'm working on my next eight books. Uh, what I do is I get an idea and I think, well, I might not write that book for five years, but now it's in my head, I will start to, um, I will start to collect material. I'll give you one, one story, which I don't think I'm ever going to write. My mother said, don't write this, it will finish your career. And, and it, it, it's, the, it's the dark side of medals. So, you know, I'm giving this one away and I feel reluctant at doing so. But I always thought, well, everyone goes on about, you know, Victoria Cross, incredible thing. But what cost did that have on the people who, 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 um, who won it? You know, what, was the, what did it take for them to win it? You know, or any medals, you know, were medals political? Were medals given away with the rations? Who, you know, the exploration of, the, of that kind of political dark side. So um, there's, I came across one story and it really ignited my interest. And there was a chap who got the DSO and uh, he was in the tanks at Combray. And he was, um, he's, he said, uh, this colonel said, we're, gonna, we're putting you forward for the Victoria Cross. And he said, I don't want it. He said, well, you've got to, well, of course you want it. Your Victoria Cross, we've got it, it'd be fantastic. You know, he said, first of all, he said, the only reason we fought like we fought was because I mucked up, because we shouldn't have been where we were. I got us into that position, and all the men in my tank know I did. So we had to fight our way out, we were going to die anyway. Secondly, there's a lot of jealousy from the other, other officers already that they think I might be getting the Victoria Cross and don't think I'm worthy of it. And thirdly, where am I going to be in every action from here on in? I'm going to have to prove the Victoria Cross. So I'm going to have to live up to the Victoria, which means I'm going to have to be the lead tank in every attack because I'm the man with the VC and I've got to prove it. So I'll be dead with the VC. I don't want it. And that's the sort of story that you don't hear about the Victoria Cross. You only hear about the gallant deeds and how it was won. But actually, there's a dark side. There's a dark side to the men who went back and beat up their wives and 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 drank themselves to death. I mean, I, I, there was one um, VC winner I was talking to my wife's old next door neighbor sadly passed on as a Spitfire pilot in the Second World War. Um, but in uh, but he said, I grew up with, in the, this village with a VC drunk and he accosted people and he shouted and swore at people and he was mentally completely shot. And you would learn that when you were walking down the road, you would cross the road, go along a bit and then come back again. Otherwise you'd get accosted or sworn at. And he said, you know, he, and he said, it was unpleasant, uh, but unpleasant all the time but nothing was ever done about it. And he just lived out his life there. And so I, that to me is a story that's never been told, that dark side of, of winning awards and what it costs to get them and the fallout and also the envy and the, and the you know, were things given politically, you know, like, a, like a, on the 16th of August, a disastrous assault at, at, at Ypres, you know, where's the one VC awarded at Langebach, the one place uh, there was success none awarded on the flanks where they fought just as hard but they got so badly cut up they had to retire so there is a there was there are political vcs not that the individual did who won it at didn't deserve it but i'm reckoning the people on the on both flanks did as well but they didn't get it because they were in the retirement so all those sort of issues so that's one story amongst many but it's about 
just immersing yourself in the Great War because there are so many stories out there that 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 still need to be told. It's not a dead history. It's not kind of worn out history. Not everything's been told. Not by a long shot. But if you go down the route of I'm going to tell a new history of Passchendaele or the Somme, then I probably won't be buying it. You know, I'm kind of I'm fed up now. I've I've got enough books now to tell me that story. I don't think that it'll be much new other than a few more you know untold memoirs discovered in lost but essentially it's it's there um so it, immerse yourself and then you'll find the stories i think that that book richard it i don't think it'd be the end of your career i think it'd be a fascinating read i really do i think that'd be an absolute fascinating read well i've, I've hoovered up a lot but it would have to be it would only be about the first world war because i wouldn't want to sort of start getting into anything later and, and especially with family and things like that but I know it would be controversial. Uh, I know one or two VCs that there are huge question marks over how they were won and whether they should have been awarded, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd be very, very conscious of not, ups of not upsetting people. But equally, there are a huge number of stories out there. As I said, I've been hoovering them up for years as so I've got a file on there. But uh, my mother was very concerned that I shouldn't write it because she said, you can't stop slagging off people's medals because, you know, they will get very upset. And I kind of, so I don't think I will write it. I suspect I'll carry on hoovering it up um, and, I'll, and I'll, it will always be an interest. But I've got so many other books to do before. Um, it's not it's not a big concern. Given your experience with World War One veterans, if some of our listeners are fortunate enough to still have relatives who served in World War Two. What advice would you give to them for recording their stories or even those who served in more recent conflicts? If they were family members, wow. Um, it so much depends on, on how the, the family dynamics really. Uh, you may find that, that a, you know, your grandfather who served at you know, uh, D-Day or, or a career or whatever will be more happy talking to someone other than your good self because you are family and... They, as I say, I've been fortunate that people have opened up to me in a way they didn't to their families. Um, but I mean, the only thing I can say is, is, is get on to it, do it. Don't think about doing it tomorrow because uh, with the people in their 90s or whatever they say are, there may not be a tomorrow. And I have a lot of regrets. I remember getting a letter from a chap, uh, I forget what regiment he was now, but he was he was at Bowman Hamill in, in November 16. And he said, 102 come and talk to me i'd love to talk to you about it and i left it about a month and i thought oh, i must get i must have this weekend i'll go and see him so i rang him up telephone rang and rang and rang oh, it must be out you know rang again telephone rang and then eventually the line went dead and then he died and i left it had i gone seen him straight away so don't leave it if it's your date if it's your relatives i mean my father lived grew up in in nazi germany in the 30s and uh and i didn't record him you know he's been gone 20 years now and i look back and i think oh god it wouldn't have taken much but i think i think when you start recording people it's almost like you're saying i know you're going to die so i'm going to get the information now and because you don't want to believe that you therefore put it off oh they'll be here tomorrow they'll be here because you want them to be there tomorrow well one day they won't be so that's my advice do it get on to it record them but being very sensitive to what you're asking them realize that there are a lot of painful issues and maybe, you know, if you can gem up a bit on their story, what you think their story is so that you can sound like you, you, you know, you're, you're more than just a casual listener. You really do care about what they say. I think it's sound advice that especially with COVID at the moment, I think it, it's a timely reminder with people that are passing away that, yeah, go out and actually record their, their stories before it is too late. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, completely. So, so just to finish up, Richard, what, what projects are you currently working on and where can the listeners get copies of your books? Well, I mean, my books are, are available on, on Amazon and other you know, websites. They're available in bookshops. So in the UK, you, you'll get them in, in most main books bookshops. In Australia, probably not so much. But um, uh, what I'm working on at the moment, I, I'm updating my book on boy soldiers. So um, I said in 2006, when it came out, that a quarter of a million boys enlisted underage in the Great War. I can tell you it was way more than that. My, I've done another 14 years research. It's way higher. 
he's, emba- he's so embarrassingly high. I'm trying to figure out ways of bringing it down. <laughs> you know, trying to just reduce the numbers. Um, so uh, that's what I'm working on. I'm, I'm doing three lists. I'm doing a list of the top 50 boys overseas in the theatre of war. Almost, I think, five Gallipoli, couple Mesopotamia, but another 50 um, on the Western Front. They have to be under the age of 15 to, uh, to be in the list. My uh, 30 youngest officers under the age of 18 on the West, or, or most on the Western Front. And then I've got a little list of my 10 youngest medal winners. So, you know, uh, um, 16, 15 year old winning the DCM and things like this. So I've got that with new material. So that's, that's really consuming me at the moment. So that will be the next kind of um, two or three months before I finish that update. And then I go on to another book using soldiers' own photographs. Um, again, um, uh, this time on dealing with Kitchener's Army, the formation of Kitchener's Army using their own pictures. So I've been hoovering those up when, as and when I can. And uh, so that's the, that's the next book. And then as I say, I've got another eight in my, well, in my head and on my desktop, you know, um, that, I, that I'd like to write down the line. Well, Rich, it's, it's been absolutely amazing to get you on and, and talk just about your experiences through talking to veterans and speaking of the Great War. And I, I'm, I've just been sitting here and just absolutely enjoying the chat. And I would love to have you back on and, and especially Pleasure. get you on and talk yes. in the future. So Richard Van Emden, thank you very much for coming on True Blue History. And we'll definitely get you back on again. Adam, before you cut off, I'm just going to have one last go at finding that thing. I found that thing. I remembered <laughs> where it was. Here we are. I remember it was in another drawer. That's the, uh, can you see? That's oh, the, wow. The, wow. The identity disc that he wore around his wrist at St. Quentin with the bullet hole through it. Rich, that so is that, that's a good note to finish on. <laughs> abs- absolutely, that is amazing. That that, and I can see it's very treasured by you. Absolutely, so it is, yeah, yeah. No, Richard, thank you very much. I really do appreciate you coming on, and we will definitely get you back on soon. My pleasure, Adam. Any time. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts, and check out our new website, True Blue History dot com for more great content.